Welcome to this edition of Completing the Puzzle with Jason DeFranco. Now, this is a special edition that we're going to be keep on doing, kind of these volumes of origins, bringing up different people, and kind of how they became who they are and what kind of made them their person. And of course, I'm your host, Matt Doolittle, and with me is Mr. Jason DeFranco. How are That's you? That's me. You're, I'm, you're, I'm you're alive? You're good? I'm alive you're, so far. We, we have a story, but it's, <coughs> it's fine. He's good to go. Near-death experience today. It's fine. So we're bringing up origin stories, and origins yep. are a big part of everybody. There, there's not one person out there that doesn't have a story of where they sure. come from, yeah. what made them, you know, how, how they got their superpower in, yep. in that terms. So, you know, in terms of, of what do you kind of look at as your superpower, and how would you describe <laughs> people find theirs? And I don't think I have a superpower. Um, when we talk about the origin stories, though, it's like, I do, I think about heroes, I think about comic books. Oh, Bruce Wayne's parents were killed in front of him. Spider, you know, Spider-Man, he was bitten by a radioactive spider, you know, these kinds of things that there's like this trigger moment. Mm -hmm. But our origin stories are usually a lot deeper than that. And, and usually we think about it as, as heroes. Heroes have origin stories. We just have life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I was reading a book by Joseph Campbell called The Hero of the Thousand Faces. And it's a great book. And he talks about the hero's journey. And, and we're all on a journey. We all experience things that change who we are. Mm -hmm. Things that are those pivotal moments in our life where we see something, we experience something, we do something, and we're not the same afterwards. And you can see people who've known us for a long time, our parents and friends from way back, they, they'll say things like, yeah, I always had an idea you'd end up like that. You know, I, I sh show traits early or yeah, something happened to something them. happened. And, uh, you know, for me, I stayed where we lived was on the wrong side of a highway from everyone else. I was, I was on this little side street that opened onto a highway. So I didn't have a large community of people to do things with because I wasn't allowed to cross the highway. Mm. So it was mostly me. I was all alone a lot as a kid. And where are you originally from? Rochester, New York. Okay. Western New York. Um, and I'd be alone a lot as a kid, and I would, you know, do what kids do. I'd make believe. I'd think up things. I'd read books. I'd watch shows. And for me, it was, there were three. It was Batman, it was the Lone Ranger, and it was Zorro. Mm -hmm. Those were the three I would watch endlessly. The, the idea of a person who's not necessarily special, mm -hmm. you know, not born with superhuman powers or something, a, a normal person who makes a decision because or, of something. Or a ton of money or something where they could just well, yeah. do it. You know, Bruce Wayne kind of <laughs> had that advantage. Like, oh, I'm going to go be Batman. Yeah, I'll go build a cave and have this car and all this. Yeah, can well, you yeah. do that if you're making 60 grand a year? I don't know. <laughs> but he couldn't fly or no, teleport or turn he, invisible. He didn't kind of show up with that. You know, well, he had Superman to... had an origin story coming yep. in as an alien, so. Well, that's the thing. I never liked Superman as a kid. I didn't either. I liked the ones that made themselves. You know, you, you get to modern superheroes and, and the way they re-envisioned Iron Man for the Marvel movies. It's mm -hmm. like, that was, that's the hero I would have identified yeah. with. The, the guy that says, all right, I've had enough. I'm going to find a way to make things different. Yeah. I'm going to find a way to take control of the situation. You know, and, and the tagline from my, the first Iron Man movie was, some heroes aren't born, they're built. Right. And I was like, yeah. And Tony Stork. Tony, proof Tony Stark has a heart and everything like that. Well, it's yeah, kind of a whole. Too. He had a whole hierarchy, and I think that going back to that book, and you gave it to me, and I've, I've read most of it. It's a long book, yeah. Pretty, pretty much through it. It's, but it, but it's everybody's good. kind of got that circle. And where did you mm -hmm. kind of like start finding where your talents, your your powers, where you could kind of focus where you wanted to be in life? I knew I wanted to have my own business. My dad had his own business. Mm -hmm. I was eight or nine. And I started cutting grass in the neighborhood. Now, I was a really little kid. I, I was always the smallest kid in my class. So when I started cutting grass for other people, I had to reach up for the lawnmower. Mm -hmm. Like, you see kids in the grocery store, they're holding the shopping cart, and they're yeah, reaching yeah. up. That was me pushing a lawnmower. Oh, wow. I, I had to hold it, you know, up basically about eye level was where I was gripping the lawnmower when I started. And they didn't have the electronic ones. No. Or the no automatic ones. Was, so yeah. I mean, they weren't push mowers, but, you know, you actually... Pulled the cord to start them, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, I didn't have a, a ride or lawnmower or anything. And I, uh, I decided I wanted to make money, so I went out in my neighborhood and uh, put cards in people's mailboxes. So, again, no internet, no downloadable PDFs, none of that kind of stuff. I sat down on a typewriter and typed up business cards one at a time. And put, it was Jay's Job Service. Now, I didn't have a business license because I didn't know anything about business. 
I also didn't know I couldn't put them in people's mailboxes. That, that and how old were is, you? I was nine. Yeah, they couldn't get a business license at any point. Well, no, <laughs> but my mom was so entertained, and I and I Jay's job service with my parents' phone number, and and that I would you know cut the grass and weed and clean things and stuff like that. And I went around to about thirty houses in the neighborhood and put my card in their mailbox. Mm. And uh, the twenty ninth house, the owner came out, saw me messing with his mailbox, as far as he was concerned. And came out to chase me away, and and I didn't want to get in a fight. I just kind of kept walking, and he went out and grabbed it, and he's like, you can't put these in mailboxes. That's against the law. The mailbox is for the post office to use only, and, and you know, threaten me with a federal lawsuit or something. Um, you because know, people's perspectives are a little bit odd sometimes. And uh, But I did that, and I started cutting grass around the neighborhood, and that became my first venture. And and my mom was just like, this kid's going to own something. He's going to have to be in business for himself because he doesn't yeah. like to listen to everybody else. That that was a key point. So, uh, you know, I did that because because I wanted to do something. I needed to feel productive. I saw my dad work so hard, and I was just like, well, what am I doing all day? I need to do something. And And I still like to play. I like to have fun. I was a kid. But I wanted to be productive. I wanted to be contributing in some way. It's not like my parents needed me to bring home money for the family or something. It's just I didn't feel like I was developing if I didn't do something. So was it kind of that entrepreneurial feel in you earlier that you're like, I have to go do something. I have to contribute. I want to create something for myself. Yeah. Because you kind of like, did you feel like you didn't have that? I, I always kind of had this feeling in me that I don't have that trampoline under me. Mm -hmm. I don't have that parachute. Yep. So if I'm, if I jump out of the plane without it, I'm screwed myself. Yep. So is that kind of how you yeah. saw it? I, I, I was very self-reliant as a kid because I was isolated a lot of the time um, you know if I wanted something I had to do it for myself mm -hmm. and I, I guess I was a weird kid I, I wanted very extreme things and I would not let go of an idea once I had it I got it in my head I wanted to get the squirrels to eat out of my hand and my dad heard me say it and he was like well you'll have to do it a little at a time let them get used to you get acclimated to you and then get them closer and closer and closer and I was like okay well I can do that it was summer Mm -hmm. I had nothing but time. So I went and sat on our front steps for a day, and no squirrels would come near me. And I told my dad that night, and he's like, well, you gotta, you got to coax them. you got to put some food where they can see it and get at it without coming to you first so they know you have it. I said, okay. So I put some food out in the yard, and I sat on the steps and just watched them go eat the food. And then the next day, I put food in my hand and sat there again. And my mom tells the story that I sat out there for three days, it was like the little kid in the Kung Fu movie, you know, that's sitting outside the temple for days. Mm -hmm. I just sat there. And my mom came out, and she was going to tell me to knock it off, come inside. And she looked, and there was a squirrel sitting on my knee eating out of my hand. And she was like, this kid, I can't believe, he just, he won't let go of an idea. He, he gets something in his head, <laughs> and he won't stop until it happens, which they were very proud of. And, you know, that's one of those triggers. Mm -hmm. When you know your parents are proud of you, when you know someone important to you saw something and was impressed by it, you want to do more of that. Right. Um, there was, you know, there was things like that that was a good experience. And my mom told all of her friends about Jay's job service and stuff like that. She was very proud of me wanting to work. Uh, so that stuck with me. The other thing that happened around the same time, I think it was probably the year before, my father and I went to a, a father and son camping trip with, with a bunch of other kids and their dads. And um, <clears throat> somewhere along the way, the dads all went to sit by the campfire and drink beer, and the, the boys were all roughhousing and acting like idiots. And I got on the wrong side of this one kid, and uh, he was way bigger than me. He was twice my size easily. Um, not just taller, but larger. He was a really big kid. And he said something about my mom. And I don't remember what it was, just that it was about my mom. And I was like, no, no, you don't talk about my mom. And he pushed me down. And I got up and ran at him. And he knocked me down again. And I got up and, went and he knocked me down again. Going. And he got fed up with it and took his jacket. He had, you know, his windbreakers and, and had those great big zippers on him back oh, then. Oh, yeah. Like, those, so, like members only? Type yeah. yeah. He had this great big zipper. Must have weighed about two ounces. And I started to and he whipped me with his jacket and it hit the the zipper hit my cheek felt like a bomb went off in my head and i'm like and i felt it and i looked and i started after him again and he hit me again and again and again 
and then I heard the shouting of the dads coming tearing in. Yeah. And what's the matter with you two? Knock it off. Rah, rah, rah. And we got in a bunch of trouble. Why are you fighting? Don't fight. Blah, blah, blah. And then my dad and I are alone going for a walk back to the tent. And he says, you know, as we were coming up on you guys fighting, I saw you get up three times and keep going in on that kid twice your size. Even though he had a weapon and you didn't, you just wouldn't stop. And I said, uh-huh. He says, look, I don't like you fighting, but that made me pretty proud. <laughs> that, that you were just wouldn't give up. Didn't matter if he had the high ground. Didn't matter if he was bigger. Didn't matter if he had a weapon. You thought he was wrong. You weren't going to stop. That stuck with me. That, that hard-headedness, that don't give up no matter what. Keep that fight in you. Keep the fight going. The, the person who wins is the one that gets up one more time than the other. Right. And so even though I hadn't knocked him down at all, mm -hmm. <laughs> I did nothing but get beaten that night. But... And, and, you know, my dad's looking at all the bruises the next day and stuff. Oh, what am I going to tell your mother? I'm gonna, i got to tell her you fell out of a tree or something. Because yeah. if you come back home looking covered in these bruises and welts and stuff, he, the kid must have hit me 20 or 30 times with Jeez. that damn jacket. And uh, I wonder it, what the kid that, uh, that hit you said. You couldn't, you couldn't put him down? What's wrong with well, you? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he got the other end of it. Right. <laughs> He's, What's wrong with you? That little squirt kept getting up. Couldn't you stop him? You know? But, but those were two, two of those moments mm -hmm. that shaped the way I thought about things. The idea of, of do something for yourself and the idea that no matter how hard you get hit, don't stay down. Getting up in and of itself, that act of defiance, is sometimes all you need to do. Get back up and do something again. Mm -hmm. Do it better. Do something different. But don't stay down. And that just, that always stuck with me. It just, it became part of how I think about things. And is that kind of how you've applied that to what, you know, we fast forward through through a couple chapters there, but <laughs> how you've kind of taken it towards your business life and, you know, some of, you know, any personal stuff and everything like that. Like how have, you, how have you pushed it kind of towards your, your business life? I, I don't believe in something being too difficult. There are times when something isn't worth the amount of effort you're going to put into it to get it to be successful. Mm -hmm. You can evaluate that, evaluate that you know, with critical thinking. You say, look, this is going to take 1,000 pounds of effort for 100 pounds of reward. I don't think that reward is worth it, so I'm going to choose not to do it. Right. But you don't get to use that as a cop-out. Oh, it's hard. Someone tells me something's going to be extremely hard. I go, yeah, so? Figure it out. I'm, I'm not interested. That's not a reason not to do something. In fact, it's usually a reason to do something. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, people asked us about opening this lab. They said, why don't you pick an easier industry? This is a wrong time to be opening that kind of a business. And I said, so it's going to be really hard. And they said, yeah. And I said, okay, good. Because if it's hard for us, it's hard for everybody. And we'll do it better and we'll try harder than most people would. And sometimes that's what it takes to win. Yeah. And when you, when you got into this industry, and just for those of you who don't know, it's a dental lab industry, and basically, you know, your crowns, uh, bridges, everything that, dentures, everything that kind of goes into, into fixing your teeth and, you know, everything like that. Um, when you look to get into this industry, what did you see you could take away as a point of, of entrance? So, like everybody was saying, this is a tough business. Why are you getting into it? Why would you do this? Even your, you, you know, you told us in a previous episode, your dad said, you get into this, I'm going to break your hands, you yep. know, so just so you can't do it. What kind of defiance did you kind of take from all those? Was it the, was it the you know, don't stay down, don't listen to anybody, or just, I'm going to do it and I'm going to make it work? It actually, it's a point of pride that if someone else can't do something and I can, I have proven something. Not that I'm better than them, mm -hmm. but that I'm willing to do the, what they're not willing to do. So the fact that people raise objections to say how difficult something is doesn't deter me. It interests me. When someone tells me that can't be done, there's a good chance I'm still thinking about it right now. Right. You know? yeah. The conversation's over, and I'm like, it really can't be done? There's got to be a way. That kind of thing comes up. Um, but also, it doesn't matter who the critic is. You know, it, Like you said, my dad told me, don't get into this business. I have tremendous respect for my dad. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter who that critic is. What I'm saying in my head is, do I know something they don't know? Am I willing to do something they won't do? Is, is there some piece of this that I can turn to my advantage? Everybody else has looked at this and said, let's set it aside. I want to take one more look and see if there's something they're missing. And that translates to other people, too. And what did you see that you could 
enter into the industry a little different? I mean, you'd worked in different labs, bigger labs, you know. Sure. Kind of the conglomerates or the Death Star type labs. <laughs> um, you know, what did you kind of see a little more clearly as, you know, going back to the, kind of your superpowers, what did you kind of take the, the blinders off and go, you know what, I can nail that? Do it better. I mean, I mean, just every time you look at an enterprise, if you can see a way it can be done better, you should ask yourself, how come I'm not doing it then? When I could look at other businesses and say, that's not how I would do that, I immediately shift into, well, if I was doing it, mm -hmm. how would I? Um, <clears throat> and there were mountains of, of experiences that, that Chad and I had had where either we didn't have the authority to make a change or we didn't have the resources to make a change or we didn't have the time to make a change. But we could see it shouldn't be like this. Right. Shouldn't it, can't it be done better than this? Um, and a lot of very savvy investors will tell you those are the kinds of things they look for. They look for a startup in an industry that says, you know, been there, done that, but there's got to be a better way. Mm -hmm. And I want to try that better way. I want to ignore the conventional thinking of the industry and try to pick a new path. And I think this will solve the ongoing problems of the industry. I think this will account for those negatives that make people say it's a bad industry or a bad business or a bad whatever. Yeah, and then, you know, for those out there who are trying to start a business or get into an, an entry, you know, get enter into a business line that they say is impossible to get into. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember, uh, you know, I, I, I talked to a friend of mine who was getting into uh, the athletic sockware, mm -hmm. you know, custom sockware, and yep. everybody told him, there's no way, you're not <laughs> going to no beat for Nike, that. you're not going to beat them or whatever. He's turned it into a multi-million dollar business where now he's got rights with the WWE, NASCAR, NBA, NFL. He's got rights with everything. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's looking, I, I, and I, I know from his story and kind of what you said here, is that it, it's using kind of that knowledge, that history you have, but then maybe sometimes it is teaming up with somebody that's got mm -hmm. another side of it. Like, sometimes it's an outsider's view. Yeah. You gotta have a different perspective sometimes. I mean, we, we almost bought a, a restaurant last week. Right. Uh, you know, we go to restaurants mm -hmm. and we see things. And we think about it. We go home unhappy. Then what? Well, you've told me you don't just <coughs> analyze the dental labs you go through. You analyze almost every business you Every business through. I interact with. It's kind of a matrix on you. Every single when you, one. When you go in there. Can't help it. So, I mean, not just people have their origins. Obviously, companies do, and they've got their, their stuff. And you mentioned Chad, who's uh, one of the co-founders of, um, of, of Team Solutions Dental. Tell me kind of the origin of that and, and where you guys kind of came together and said, you know, we'll, we'll go do that. We're going to leave where we are, secure paychecks, secure lives, get rid of this, get rid of that, and let's just start our own thing. How did that come risk? When, when did you guys <laughs> decide you're going to start your own origin story for TSD and what, what the company's grown into over the six, seven years? When I got fired. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's a, good, that's a good way to get it started. Yeah, our, our previous employer fired me and, and under bad terms. And uh, we both thought, that isn't right. And we had different ideas about what to do next and talked it through and ended up deciding to start Team Solutions. Um, but that origin went back, when I look back, to other things that had happened between he and I prior to that. Mm -hmm. That we had encountered situations that needed solving that were difficult. And we came at them from different perspectives. And, and in fact, one of them, he hotly contested my solution. I, was t I technically outranked him at the other company. And I made a decision about something that affected people he knew that he disagreed with. And he let me know that he disagreed. Yeah. Um, like, hotly, like, thought it was very unfair. And for a little while, didn't even want to talk to me. He thought I had judged someone very unfairly. Mm -hmm. um, and later on, as we talked about it, he heard the rest of my side of it, and it made sense to him because he'd only gotten part of the story. But um, as we looked at problems that we would solve differently and as we looked at problems that we would solve the same, we would encounter something, and I'm like, what do you want to do about this? Mm -hmm. and, and he would offer a solution. I'm like, yeah, that's what I would want to do too. We found out that we were very much in alignment about you know, how to get things done. Do you feel like sometimes people get their, you know, their kick in the butt, like you said, you were kind of forced into having to go start your own thing. Do you think people kind of find their origins by accident? Oh, yeah. Yeah. If, if you look at, the, you know, the hero's journey, um, you start out with kind of a normal person in a normal world and something goes wrong. That's usually how it goes. Mm -hmm. Something goes wrong 
their village burns down or, you know, an alien attacks or whatever, something goes wrong and they feel a call. They feel a call to action. They feel like, ah, this is wrong. I've got to do something about this. Um, sometimes it's not quite so dramatic as that. Right. Uh, sometimes someone just kind of looks at their own life and says, this isn't what I had in mind. I, I've got to do something different. I've got to step it, outside. Find a different path. Yep. We call them uh, crossroads applicants or crossroads employees. I love finding people, and there's all different kinds of crossroads people go through, but I love finding people that are at that point of decision in their lives where they're like, okay, either I've done something for a certain period of time or I've lived my life a certain way for a period of time or there's a big change hitting me, and I've got to figure out what's next. And if you find that person and it's a good match, they'll always remember that. They will always be more loyal, more involved, more invigorated by what you do if they were at that point and they can say, hey, when I applied for this job, I really wasn't sure what was going to happen. There were a lot of things going on for me right then. And, and most of our better employees have some kind of a story like that. Uh, you know, we talk about these things being the hero's journey. Well, what's a hero? I mean, what? Okay, you, Iron Man and Thor, yeah. superheroes. But, but, you know, what's a hero? The, a firefighter? Police officer? Mm -hmm. A soldier? Okay, well, yeah, we can point to that and go, those are heroes. Those are people putting their life on the line for the protection of others or to do the right thing. Those are heroes. Are they the only heroes? Because we don't generally have lions prowling outside the village these days in the world. No. There isn't a need to protect the village like that, like there was in, in early times when tribes first formed. So, you know, we've got, we've got disadvantaged people. You look at people with physical limitations and the things they accomplish, and people are always impressed when they see someone who has some kind of severe physical disability compensating, using their will, using their smarts, using something to compensate for some physical limitation, whether they're in a wheelchair or, or handicapped in some other way. And we can always point at those people and say, that, that's an unusual well of strength. Mm -hmm. And we can point to that and go, that's, that's heroic. I can, I can look at that with admiration. Well, you could have heroes <clears throat> within a company, within departments, sure. within you know, somebody that, that came in and didn't know that they were going to be able to go work in a certain <clears throat> area. Or maybe you've, you know, are you able to look at somebody and go, I see something that they don't see <clears throat> and that you can go move them around? Oh, all the time. I, I love that. And the, then they can people are deep. There's, yeah. there's stuff under the surface. And society, the school system, a bunch of things are designed to beat some of that out of us, to, to take people and turn them into drones. Mm -hmm. You know, the, you can hear endless podcasts about that kind of thing, about the, you know, the, the educational industrial complex, you know, the, the idea that schools are not churning out free thinkers, they're churning out potential factory workers. Right. But that's not what we need so much. I mean, uh, we don't have that many factories these days. Mm -hmm. We need people who can think, who can problem solve, who can do creative things. Who, we have needs for a whole lot more. And some people get in that mode after that conditioning and kind of stay there. And it doesn't mean there's not something beneath the surface. It's just they've been taught not to use it, or they've been taught to hide it, or right. to ignore it. If you can find that, isn't that a hero? Isn't that its own kind of a journey? If I, if I want to look at myself and be proud of myself, and I find a person who is undervalued or misunderstood, and I can dig a little deeper and find out what's special about them, bring it out and let them use it, I think that's heroic. Yeah. It's not at great personal risk like a firefighter, but I think it's heroic because it makes a difference in people's lives. And, and in the end, that's what a hero does. Yeah. They go and do something someone else wouldn't do because they see a need for it, and at the end, they make a difference. That, that's the basic definition of heroics. Well, that's all around us. Business, I see as a heroic venture. Mm. Oh, you know? yeah. I mean, it's, and it's a, it's a dangerous one, especially somebody that's getting into you know, a company of their own. Starting a business mm -hmm. is incredibly hard, and keeping it going is even harder. You yeah. know, making it successful, growing <laughs> it, and, you know, I, I mean, there's, you know, how many stories out there have just failed this or that, and it, it may have been a reason of their own, or it may have just been, you know, look what we went through for the last year and a half. Absolutely. There's nothing they did wrong. 
No. Um, do you do you think there's there's a will in people to kind of find that in themselves eventually? It I mean, depends. They can traipse along in their daily job. You know, they grab their lunch pail, they go to the office, they, you know, push the papers, and they've got to go home to the wife and kids because they're a hero to their family. Mm -hmm. But to themselves, they're like, I could do. I could be something. more. What do you think could draw that out of people? If they're looking for that. They've got to see an example. They've got to see. Uh, you know, I look at it all the time. I'm constantly repeating other people's stories here. When we go through new higher orientation, I'm telling them stories of success mm -hmm. of the people that are already here. I'm telling them about other employees who, who have gotten outside of their comfort zone, done something cool, and been well rewarded for it. I'm constantly, you know, updating the mythology. That's what it is. It's an oral tradition. It's a mythology. Right. It's making sure people know the stories of the people that came before, of the people that did really cool things, and what the result was that this is why we're here, this is how this happened, this mattered long term. Um, you know, when I, was, <laughs> when I was a kid one time, again, I stayed by myself a lot. I was, I was an extrovert, but had nobody around me, mm -hmm. so I was an introvert and didn't know how to socialize really with people when I started getting larger groups. I still don't. I, don't. I don't like large groups. I mean, I like the energy of a large group. But I don't like socializing in a large group. I like one-on-one -on -one or two or three people interactions where you can really talk meaningfully. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have a terrible time with small talk. I can't do it. Yeah. I can't do – it's just terribly wasteful in my mind. I get you have to get through that sometimes to make friends with people. Yeah. I probably miss out on a lot of friendships because I don't have the patience to do the small talk before going, so what really matters to you? You know, yeah, yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. Um, but when I was younger, my parents were worried about how I was struggling socially, just not interacting well with other people. And, and they had me go sit and talk with someone, with a counselor, and they were asking me, you know, what is it about you that's, that you don't think you should be talking to other people or something? They, they thought I had low self-esteem or something, which <laughs> was never my problem. Right. Um, and I said, you know, I'm kind of like the leader of the misfits. And they said, what do you mean? I said, all of my close friends are, are misfits. They're, they're, they don't fall into one of society's nice, neat little categories. Or even if they do, it's not where they want to be. I have a friend, Mark, who is a very athletic guy. He was on all the sports teams and stuff in high school and hated it. He, he wasn't an athletics guy. He was a physical guy. He liked doing things with his hands. He ended, he ended up working for a period of time in construction before he switched to using his brain. Mm -hmm. He liked being physical. But he hated everything about sports. He enjoyed cerebral activities. He enjoyed you know, flights of fancy. He enjoyed theoretical conversations. He thought that those were way more fun. So on the surface, he was a jock in high school, but he never hung out with the rest of the jocks. He was always playing Dungeons and Dragons in somebody's basement or something and had to keep it a secret so it didn't ruin his image as yeah. a jock. All of my friends were like that. They didn't fit into any of the nice, neat categories. So I told the counselor, it's like I'm the leader of the misfits. And he's like, how'd you become their leader? And I said, well, I don't know. He's like, did you set out to be their leader? I said, no. He says, are you sure you are their leader? And I said, well, yeah. Yeah, because they always wait for me to decide everything. Yeah, calling, um, calling you to be like, what are we doing today? Yeah, yeah. And, and he says, well, how does that make you feel? And I said, actually really good, because I don't like the cliche people. I like the people who are different. I like the people who, you know, you got to get to know them before you realize how cool they are. It's not on the surface. Mm -hmm. It's something inside them. Um, and he was like, yeah, I, I think you'll do fine. <laughs> you know, yeah, he, he stopped way. trying to counsel me. He told my parents, don't worry about him. He's fine. He just, he's just got a small, isolated group of friends, but he, he's a good kid and he knows what he wants. And do you feel like that him, you know, even you talking to that counselor and you saying, you know, I'm the leader of the misfits, did that kind of sit in your head and you didn't even realize it? Oh, yeah. Did that bring it out? And then when, when, you when went, I verbalized when it, you went back to them? I never thought of it that way. Yeah, I, I, I'd never thought of it that way until I verbalized it. I hadn't even really thought of myself as the leader until I had to put myself in a position that I could label to explain it to him. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, I then went back and looked at the misfits and went, misfits are cool. Yeah. It's, it's like the 80s movie, Revenge of the Nerds. Oh, you yeah. Know? Yeah, yeah. All, all of a sudden, it's like, wait, wait. Yeah, this is supposed to be an outcast thing. This is supposed to be a, a negative. It's really not. Mm -mm. It really isn't. And you, and you look today... Nerds, Today, if you, nerds are in the world, yeah, Let's just put it. The, I mean, look at everything that's if, out there right now. If you don't like Star Wars or Marvel or something, you're yeah. kind of like, well, what's wrong with you? Don't you have any imagination? Yeah, don't <laughs> you like one of these things? I mean, look at all the leaders of the world right now. Yeah. I mean, you know, your Bezos, your you know, your uh, uh, 
um, the, oh, what's his name? The, the Elon Musk, mm-hmm. you know, all those guys there. You, they, you wouldn't put them in a category, really, I don't right. think. When The way they were coming up with that, I think that they kind of had that, you know, you, you want to see those origin stories of those guys and everything. Um, do you look for that? And we, we had a whole hiring series. You can see it on the rest of the podcasts. Um, do you kind of look for that when you're interviewing somebody? Do you I want to see a story. Like lots of times, if I'm looking at an application, it's just a piece of paper. You can't tell enough about a person there. Mm-hmm. I look for a couple of patterns. Some, there's some stuff that shows up over and over, good and bad, when you're, when you're looking at lots of these things. But I'm just looking, can I tell a story? Is there something here, as I'm reading this list of positions and this list of goals or accomplishments, is there a story here that makes sense to me? And lots of times, I'll bring someone in for an interview, just to have them tell me, what's the story with all this? This is a very odd, it's an eclectic mix of jobs. Mm -hmm. You've traveled a lot, whatever it is. Tell me that story. Give me something. Let me understand you a little better so I can see if you're a fit or not. What happened here? How'd Mm -hmm. you end up here? Where'd you, you know, why'd you take off to this side of the country and then come back? That type of stuff. Absolutely. Because I I think that adds character and it adds, you know, something they can bring to a company. And, you know, and I, I think that helps build the story you know, of a company, um, you know, you, you've got some key partners and employees here. Are there any that stick out to you that, you know, you're like, oh, that <laughs> that one, and I, 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 I'm still watching them go through their journey? Almost all of them, including <laughs> me. That's the, so you, you say, well, the origin story, that was the beginning, mm-hmm. right? Well, what's the origin story for next time? Origin stories are still happening. They're happening around us and to us and with us. Mm-hmm. So maybe maybe it's the origin story of, you know, now it's my origin story of the retiree that built a bunch of companies, and I'm starting that origin story now. Yeah. Hey, what made you decide to open 38 companies in 14 years? You know, that kind of thing. Maybe it's someone else's origin story that now I'm playing a different role in. Origin stories frequently, heroic journeys, they've always got a mentor, or, you know, it's the old wizard that tells them where they need to go or whatever. Those, those kinds of journeys always have people along the way that either either help someone find their way or give them a kick so they get out the door in the first place. Um, so, so understanding that it's not all about me. But also, helping someone on their journey can be the next step in your journey. You know, like I said, tomorrow's origin story? Mm-hmm. What's the origin of the next CEO of Team Solutions? Well, I don't know. Who is it? Well, I don't know. We haven't heard the story yet. You yeah. know, there's, there's stories being told right now. Building those up and yeah. kind of keeping track of those on your own. Mm-hmm. Now, and, and there's a lot of materials out there, and I know you've mentioned a few, but, you know, as far as, you know, you said, you know, somebody needs to be inspired or they need to find something that they could watch, read, I don't know, listen to, like this podcast, uh, <laughs> that they, they should kind of focus on or maybe they could look at that and there's something they could pull out of those. Like what kind of materials do you kind of go, here's these books, here's these movies, you know, even if it's a Star Wars type thing. Like <laughs> what, what, what are kind of your top three things that you would tell someone, hey, read this, watch this, listen to this? Reframe a story. Take a story you like and reframe it with yourself in it. You know, you can take a fantasy story. You can take Lord of the Rings. Okay, so, you know, Frodo had to get kicked out the door. He had to start the journey. Why did he start the journey? Because he found out there was this ring there that was a big problem, and he needed to get it out of town. Mm -hmm. That was the start of his journey. He was told by someone who knew better that this can't stay here. you got to get it out of here. you got to get moving. So he stepped out the door and went for a walk. Um, Okay, how about we reframe that without the fantasy setting? Someone that just graduated high school. Okay, you've been comfortable. You've been living in the village, and you've been going to the carnivals and having fun with your friends, and now someone, a traveler, is in town, and wow, they've got interesting stories. What are you going to do? Are you just going to sit there, or are you going to do something? Um, you, you can reframe virtually any story that way. You know, you've got to know that there's a whole world out there of opportunities, whether you're young or old. You know, to me, I'm barely scratching the surface of opportunity. I see opportunities everywhere. I wish I had a thousand hours in my day because there's so many things I want to try and do and explore and know and see. Mm-hmm. There's opportunities everywhere. And if people aren't seeing them, there's only two possibilities. One is they're isolated physically. They're just not exposing themselves. And two is they're missing them. They're just happening right in front of them and they're not even seeing them. You got to think, what if that was me? 
what if I had to do something about this? Is that about keeping your mind open to you know opportunities? It's that whole thing about just say yes for a whole day and see what happens. Sure. You know, just yeah. just go with it. Like somebody says, you want to go to you want to jump on a plane and go to L.A. tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've, don't you have responsibilities and a wife and a kids and a job? Yeah. But yeah, let's go. <clears throat> let's see what happens with this. I heard a great thing in in one of the books. I read anything to learn about people. And at one point, I went on this this spree of reading all of like the pickup artist stuff. There was there was a character there was a character named Mystery who wrote a book. Um, there, there's uh, 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 Neil Strauss wrote a couple of books. There's there's a bunch of authors who have written books about the pickup artist lifestyle. Well, it's not really a lifestyle, but there, there's some things about the lifestyle and. Um, reading them, they're all about human social dynamics. They're all about understanding people. And in one of them, this guy, Mystery, he had a show on VH1 where he would take a bunch of misfits mm -hmm. and teach them how to talk to girls, how to pick people up. And he would give them these, these stories to tell. He, he called it canned material, these stories that he had basically pre-recorded. He's like, here, just say this. Mm -hmm. um, and he says, you got to have good stories. you got to be able to tell people interesting things that have happened to you. And one of the people says to him, what if you don't have any good stories to tell people about what you've done? And he says, first of all, use mine for now. They're all written down. You can read them and pretend it's you. But that's not true. You're playing a game. But go get some. If you want to be able to tell someone about the day you woke up and didn't know what country you were in, you're going to have to go to another country. Mm -hmm. If you want to be able to tell someone about the time you survived a shark attack, you got to get in the water. You know, you're not going to have exciting stories unless you go do exciting things. You're not going to be seen as a person of the world if you've never left Poughkeepsie. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to get out of your door and go do things. Um, I learned more when I traveled than in any focused educational setting I was ever in in my life. Just when I was in the military, and I would find myself in Germany for a couple of days, and then find myself in, God, I was in Turkey for three months. I was in Saudi Arabia for a few months. I was in uh, oh, Spain, England. Uh, I, I woke up one night on a beach in Greece. I woke up. I had flown out of another country. Mm -hmm. In the middle of the night, I had just hopped on the first thing smoking kind of deal. Landed, I was so tired with a few other friends, and they just they drove us to a hotel. We didn't even know where we were checking in. We just checked in, got up the next morning, walked out the back of the hotel, and we're on a beach. And we're like, where the heck are we? I don't know. Where did he say we were landing? I don't know. I don't remember. Don't you remember? I don't remember. I was so tired. And we're wandering around a beach. We don't know how we're getting out of there. We don't know where the flight crew is for the plane that landed here. Wow. We don't even know what hotel we're in unless we go down to the front desk and look. Yeah. It, was, it was surreal. And I never would have, I thought, you know, that's some crazy bohemian gypsy thing. Yeah. I was in the military and doing stuff like that. And I learned so much going to different places and meeting people from other cultures and just waking up in the morning going, hey, I'm on a beach. Let's see what's down here. Do it, it was fascinating. Do you think it's important for people to kind of take a step back and reflect on themselves, you know, occasionally of where they've been, what they've done, and how they got to where they are? Oh, sure. Whether it's good or bad. You know, whether yeah. they've, you know, they've had a traumatic childhood, they went through some bad times, you know, they, they were kind of self-destructive, <laughs> or, you know, all the positive stuff. But even how did you get to this point? Because two people could get to the same exact point through two different paths. Yeah. One of my favorite episodes in... I'm a nerd. Star Trek Next Generation. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite episodes is one in which uh, Picard is in surgery. The captain is probably going to die. He needs a heart transplant. Mm -hmm. And they reflect back on why does he need a heart transplant? Because he has an artificial heart that was damaged in a fight. Well, why do you have an artificial heart? And it takes you back to... When he was young and reckless, he'd gotten into a bar fight and gotten stabbed in the heart, and just through the miracle of advanced medicine, mm. his life had been saved. So he's now dying on the table, and the, the god figure, Q, from the series, uh, appears to him and says, hey, you're about to die. Would you like me to help? And he's like, he doesn't like the guy. He's like, no, leave me alone. He's like, really? You want to die right now? What if I could make it all better? 
And he takes him back in time and says, well, I'm going to let you avoid this fight so that you don't get stabbed through the heart. So he goes, okay, and he changes. Mm-hmm. He, he shows some restraint because he was a reckless, headstrong punk in his 20s. And he shows some restraint. And then he moves back to the present day, and he has a very unimportant job. He, he's a very mediocre performer at a very mid-level bureaucratic job. Instead of being the captain of the, the flagship of the fleet, mm-hmm. he's kind of a nobody. And he's like, how did this happen? And the story is, he was headstrong and reckless, and he did almost get killed. But being that kind of a person gave him a bunch of experiences that he learned from. And he's not quite like that today. Today he has learned through years to apply wisdom and temperance and things. But if he'd never been that headstrong punk, he never would have had the experiences that gave him the confidence to become the man he ended up being. So it the the show ends with him choosing the other way. Right. He says, you know what? It's okay. I'm good to go. If I die today because I lived this life, I'm all right with that. Put me back. Yeah. And he, he puts himself back in the situation and goes ahead and and, and the, the enemy stabs him through the chest and he starts laughing because he restored his timeline. He, yeah. he, and he's laughing because he knows what it means. He knows it means he's going to have this great life because he was willing to risk things when he was younger. And, and we've all got to figure out our own level of risk tolerance. But if you're not a little bit risky and a little bit crazy when you're younger, make up for it. Yeah. Make up for it now. You know, I'm, I'm constantly going, hey, have I had enough fun? Is there some wild, crazy thing that I've never tried that I really should go do? Not because I'm having a midlife crisis, but because I know those things enrich me. They give me new perspective, new ideas. My near-death experience today. Maybe I'm going to think differently about things tomorrow. <laughs> Let, let's, let's put that in perspective. It was a, it, it was a small mid-death experience. It almost ended with an ambulance, but everything's fine. I don't want everybody to think you jumped out of a plane and the chute didn't almost go off. It was. I, I'll try that next. Uh, <laughs> I did it. It was fun. You know. the, sh- the chute didn't open? I, no, well, I went, well, no, I jumped out of a plane. I'll do it once, and that's it. Uh, so, I mean, what it, do you feel like it's okay for people that come into an organization? Like, how much, you know, they always say when you go into an interview or you're, you know, when you hang out, don't tell too much of your personal life sometimes. That's crap. That's crap. Yeah. I've always kind of thought that. You've got be to. Be you, be all you. Yeah. If other people don't like it, too bad. If they don't like the real authentic you, what do you want to work there for anyway? What do you want to be with that person for anyway? If you got to hide who you are and how you think, I mean, of course, we mitigate extreme behavior during a process when someone doesn't know us yet. Mm -hmm. We take it down a notch just because we don't want to overwhelm another person with us being too comfortable or something. But it doesn't mean you should change it. Just turn the volume down a notch. You shouldn't have to hide who and what you are because then you'll always have to hide it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't hide it, chances are you're going to stand out because you know what? I've done thousands of interviews and 90% of them come off exactly the same. I couldn't tell them apart. They just go down the they line. They go down the, 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 yep, the safe route. Yeah. The it, safe route. They've watched a couple of YouTube videos on how to interview, mm-hmm. and they, they don't tell a story. Like, I, I've always thought it was better to have that authenticity from anybody, or, like, my group of friends, we all just let it all out. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows everything. It's an open book. I've always been an open book, and sometimes they're like, eh, maybe I shouldn't have told that story. I'm like, whatever. It's out there. So, I know I can never get into politics. Oh, oh. I've got too many skeletons. I've yep. got too many dirty jokes. I've got too many I got a few raunchy stories yeah, or yeah. whatever. Yep. And So I can't get into politics. Who says I would want to? Mm-hmm. You know, it, I would rather be me. You know, they, the what's the line? Uh, rather be partying in hell with the sinners than living in heaven with the saints, yep. or something like you know. Yep. Yep. Um, the, and and there's all those spinoffs of those lines. But the idea is, if being you is being loud and energetic and crazy, be that. Don't try to be something else because society expects you to. Chances are. You will fit into one of those nice, neat little categories that will get you a nice, neat little category job Mm -hmm. instead of something that's really going to allow you to use who you are. doesn't mean you should be a reckless fool your entire life. No. You've got to pay bills. You've got to raise a family. You've got to do things in life. But this idea that you should try to fit yourself into someone else's boxes or someone else's image is so self-limiting. That's how people end up 
having midlife crises. They tried to be what the position was supposed to be until they lost sight of who they really were. And then they have this wild outburst. You know, it's like American Beauty, you know, when Kevin Spacey suddenly transforms. Goes crazy. And all yeah. of a sudden, he's having a great life because he's being himself mm -hmm. instead of trying to fit in other people's categories. Now, bad example because he ends up getting shot in the head. But, oh, spoiler alert. But, <laughs> it's but, 20 years old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the reality is there's an awakening that happened there. It's the same thing that happens in all of those kinds of movies. It's the same thing in uh, Wanted with Angelina Jolie. In uh, all those kinds of movies, someone just kind of can't take it anymore and they just have to be who they really are mm -hmm. instead of this, this fake image that they've created, Jerry Maguire. All of a sudden, they're doing something radically different because they, had, they couldn't contain it anymore. They had to be their authentic selves. And it's transformational. All of a sudden, they're having an incredibly great life. Might not have the things they had before. It might be different things, but it's real. Mm -hmm. And that's so, it's uplifting. And, and to go kind of on the, the opposite side of, you know, having the great life and all that, I've, I've always believed that every scar has a story, mm -hmm. whether it's physical, emotional, Absolutely. mental. And, and, you know, we touched on it a little bit, but what do you feel you can pull from the bad stuff? You know, like say you, you know, you got in a, a stupid bar fight and you got stabbed in the heart or, mm -hmm. you know, you, you know, you broke up a few times or you lost the love of your life because yep. you did something stupid or, yep. you know, you, you lost that business because, I don't know, you punched the wrong guy at a bar. You right. Know? Like, how, how do you, what do you think you can start pulling from the bad stuff? You know, it's always, you know, learn from your mistakes, but those scars are there no matter what. They're oh, not yeah. going to go away until you're dead. Embrace them. Love them. That's what made you into who you are. And if you didn't learn something useful from it, look at it again. Look at it with a few years' perspective. Look at how it could have gone otherwise. Yeah, you missed out on things, or things went badly at times. But if you hadn't done that thing, you know, the whole one door closes, another opens, it's true. It's just that usually we're too upset about the door that closed to notice the one that opened at the time. Mm -hmm. People, every time I've had a bad experience, I am unhappy, I'm sad, I am I'm melancholy, I, I withdraw from people. When I have a really bad experience, when I lose someone I care about, when a relationship doesn't go well, when even a friendship has, has soured, I start withdrawing. And for a period of time, not, not months, just, just for a short period of time, usually a day or two, I just kind of don't want to deal with anyone or anything. And towards the end of that time period, I just, I, I hear myself say it, okay, what's next? That's just the thing that repeats over and over in my head. Mm -hmm. Okay, that happened, what's next? Um, and, and I have found overwhelmingly that as soon as I do that, there's something, there's something right there yeah. that I wouldn't have noticed if I was still hanging my head and feeling sorry for myself. I pick myself up and look around and go, okay, what's next? Oh, look. And I move towards the next thing. Yeah. I don't move away from anything. No. I only move towards things. When you move towards things, how important it is for, is it for you to bring along the right people? It's you, critical. And, and, and learning their journey, and you know, it could be complete opposite. It could be Shrek and Donkey, for God's sakes. <laughs> you know, but you, even though there's that person that you're like trying to push them away, and you know, you don't want them part of your life, but they, for whatever reason that 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 happens in your life, and you're like all right, now we're friends for life, or you know, oh, yeah. we're, we're going to go start a business or something. How important is it to make sure that you're kind of keeping an eye for that? You know, you, you know, like you said, you and Chad started this business, and look what it's turned into. Or you've got to find that one person that's going to push you one way, and you can push them the other. And keeping an eye out for that, but also learning what their journey is. How important is that? It's critical. It's Unless you want to go be a poet by yourself in the desert somewhere, mm. the only way to get anything significant done in this world today is with other people. Individual accomplishment is so tiny by comparison. Of course, here and there, you're going to find one person that does something in isolation and they bring out this masterpiece of, of art or something that they did totally on their own. But those are so unusual and infrequent. And even when they do, most of the time it is overlooked and ignored. The things that are really noticed are the things that people do with others because you need others to have a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. 
You can only make so many ripples. It doesn't matter how loud you shout, only so many people can hear you. But if you get a hundred other people saying the same thing and they're all a mile apart, a whole lot of people have heard it. So it doesn't matter if it's a, if it's a message or an idea or a piece of work. You, you have to interact with other people today to have consequence. The more people, the more consequence. We knew this was going to be a business that grew, in part because the more people we impacted, the better we felt about that impact. So we wanted to impact more people. Because now you're having an impact on their journey. Exactly. So you're part of that story that just keeps going. Right. And as that journey keeps going, how important is it, and have you done this, to kind of lay it out and go, this is where I want it to go, but always have that idea. <laughs> it is going to veer off the road, and I have to have a plan Z. Absolutely. You always have a destination in mind. It could be a general destination or a specific one. And you try to map it out. But there will always be detours. Now, you can see the detours as a problem and give up. You can see the detours as a distraction and get so caught up in the detour you never make it to your destination. Or you can see the detours as ways to learn something, ways to add something, ways to modify your approach. And then when you get to the destination, you're even better at whatever it was you were doing. Mm -hmm. Do you think if someone is starting their business and you know, they're putting everything together. Should they look into themselves to put that business together? Should they look at an opportunity? Should they go find a, you know, a franchise to jump into as an investment or a property or what, you know, what, how important is it? And everybody says this, you know, find something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. And and like, I know you kind of preach that when you do the orientations here, you know, if you don't want to be here, you don't have to be here. Right. And I think that's part of the journey is that you don't want to be miserable every day. You know, what should someone kind of look into in their past, in their origin story, as they're looking for a new career or as they're looking to start a business? Well, there's the cliche thing. Think back on it. Begin with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. You know, what are you going to want to say about this moment 10 years from now? Does it matter to you if it is buying a franchise or building something from scratch? Does it matter to you if you're doing it as a supporting character for someone else or if you need someone else to support you? Does it matter to you if it pays a lot of money or it's just satisfying? You know, what are those things that, say 10 years, that 10 years from now looking back, you want to be able to say about how that went? That'll clear up a lot of it. And if you don't know the answer... Mm -hmm then you're not ready. If you don't have a burning need to do something entrepreneurial, if you don't look at something and say, I have to do that, you shouldn't because it's too hard to do it casually. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people out there right now, and I, I know I've, I've talked about it with, with Shay and, and we, we've jo- joked around about it, but there's so many easy ways to make a quick career right now. There's your TikToks and YouTube influencers and everything. And I, I feel like they've been kind of forced into that in a way of quick, easy money sure. as a business, as they're, they're kind of looking at their journey. And, and money's important, but is that really what everybody should be looking for in their journey? Depends on what they want. Look, money's important. It's how we get the things we want in life in many ways. Mm -hmm. It's not how we get the relationships we want, but virtually everything else that we want. It's either a relationship or it costs something. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much what it comes down to. Money's important. And to most people, the harder they work, the more they would like to have to show for it. But money's important up to a point. After that point, it drops in importance. There's no amount of money you can pay me to do a job I hate. I, I, I will say no. I would rather do something I enjoy for less money, no matter the amount. People say, well, you can say that. What if I gave you a million dollars a year to do something you hate it? I wouldn't do it. There isn't a dollar amount. Unless it reaches such a number that I could just bite my tongue for a week and then cash a $10 million check, mm-hmm. I won't do it. There's, yep. there's, just, there's no way. You give up too much of yourself doing things that you hate. You lose your spirit. You lose your energy. You can't pay me enough to make me lose my spirit and my energy. So the money is important. For most people, money ends up being a scorecard. It starts out being a survival tool. It starts out, I need money to pay my rent. I need money to buy a new car. I need money to put my kids through school. I need money for... 
after a certain point, when you get a certain amount of money, that money, that amount's different for different people, but when you get a certain amount, you don't need more. You want more. And then it can be a healthy want or an unhealthy want. Mm -hmm. If you can't stop trying to get more just because you need to have it, it's like an addiction, then that doesn't make sense. If you're choosing to do things that get you more because you like what it gets you and you're staying true to yourself and you're continuing to develop, then great, that's natural. That's organic. That's appropriate. Okay? Mm -hmm. But at some point, money stops being a necessity. It starts being a convenience. At that point, other things will become more important. Okay. A couple more things. What has been your favorite part of your journey to today, right now, at this point? What has been your favorite thing that you could point back on mm. and go, that's where either your turning point was or what was the favorite thing that you've had happen along the way? Wow. Man, I don't know if there's one. Um, I mean, it, the relationships. Um, the relationship I had with Josh, my mentor, was, was fantastic. It was enlightening. To find someone that thought like I thought, I just wasn't as evolved yet in my thinking. Mm -hmm. And to realize it was okay to think that way because most of the people I was interacting with thought that I was weird for the way I thought about things. Um, reading the seven habits. I did that because I knew I had to improve. Mm -hmm. And reading it changed a whole bunch of perspectives. Um, launching the business knowing we might fail. Believing we wouldn't, mm -hmm. but knowing we could. And saying, burn the ships. And that's all been part of the relationships you've been able to yeah. build, too. Because mm -hmm. I've seen you be able to grow that, you know, within the company alone. You know, I, I've gone through all the photos and trying to look for things. And I can see the, the you know, people evolving in their positions here. Sure. Where they've gone from the front all the way to the middle, all the way to the, you know, to now they're, you know, they went from wearing scrubs to wearing button-up shirts. And, mm -hmm. You know, everything like that. And I think that you can see that progressive history in that story. Here. Yeah. The, the collective story. That's the coolest thing. I'm, I'm always teasing Melissa. I'm like, you can put that in the book. She's like, what book? I'm like, someone's got to write a book sooner or later about all this they're, stuff. They're going to put a book about it. <laughs> they got to. But um, so, and, and, and kind of wrapping up as we do this first, and we're, like I said, we're going to do a whole series on these kind of different aspects where this is the end of the kickoff. When someone's looking at their own journey, what, you know, and you just kind of told me what, what was the biggest perspective in yours, where should they look for kind of that inspiration? Is it within themselves, within their friends, their family, TV, books, the stars, the UFOs that are going to show up in a couple weeks? You know, where should they kind of look at that as their big inspiration before they head out into the world, whether it's, you know, a kid coming out of high school now because we've got graduations coming up, college, whether they're just ready to quit their job and be like, I can't do this anymore. I think it's a combination. It depends on where they're at in their life because... Especially when I was younger, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do something. I knew I wanted to matter. I knew I wanted to have fun with what I did. But I couldn't just look inside myself and produce an idea for what my future should hold. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had to look at other people, and I still didn't see what I actually wanted. So honestly, for me, it's an amalgam. It's you take things like movies, you know, heroic ideas and say, OK, but there's no dragons to slay. There's no lightsabers to swing. There's, you know, those are the ideas. How can I live like that in the everyday world? What are your dragons? What are your mm -hmm. demons? What are what can you <clears throat> slay or what can you look at is like there's my damsel in distress that yep. I need to go save? Absolutely. So that's how they can look at it. And that's how we're going to wrap up this episode of Completing the Puzzle with Jason DeFranco. Thank you so much. Make sure you head over, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, share it, do all that fun stuff. Right now, we are on Spotify and YouTube, so make sure you find us. We're going to be on a few more outlets coming up with a lot more stuff coming up on our social media. Until next time, see you later. Thanks, Matt. Thank you.